Hi, this is Stacy from The Advisor today. I'm very excited because we have a very special guest today. It's Lieutenant Dan, and he's going to talk about weapons, security, and he's going to focus on parenting and, and all of the different tips on how to protect your family and loved ones and how to go about this. Now, before we begin, I just want to do a quick shout out to dmaworld.com. They are a marketing consultant group that helps little businesses not get scammed by those big marketing companies. They they help people build their businesses and not have to pay a fortune. So dmaworld.com is a great consultant uh, firm to look into for your uh, marketing needs for your businesses. So today we have Lieutenant Dan here. So Lieutenant Dan, can you tell people a little about yourself and what you do? And uh, this is very interesting. I'm very excited to get into this conversation with you. Thank you, Stacey. I appreciate you having me on. Uh, my last name is pronounced Deleuze Nesky, and I know it's a tough one, but uh, <laughs> folks out there, you'll be able to find me on uh, Amazon, my book, The First Five Minutes, and I'm on LinkedIn, and I'm also on uh, The First Five Minutes or on Facebook. Uh, but yeah, it, uh, I appreciate you having me on. It's an important subject. It is an uncomfortable subject, uh, but my background, I spent 24 years with the Secret Service up in Washington, D.C. I was very fortunate to be able to stay in the, the district area, I didn't get moved around all over the country because I was with what was called the Uniform Division. And that was a separate division of the Secret Service. And it, the neat thing about it was it had all the specialized positions. It had canine and the motorcycles and the counter snipers and the SWAT team and the uh, crime scene search people. So it just was something that I, I was interested in. And once I had my time in, I put in for canine. And I was very fortunate as uh, being uh, not many years on uh, one of the juniorist uh, officers to get uh, my canine. And his name was Korak. And he was a black Belgian uh, Malinois. And if people who have Belgian Malinois know they're absolutely crazy, uh, but <laughs> very intelligent, almost too intelligent. And <laughs> he lived, he was 13 years old. So he had a very good life. And I miss him dearly. And uh, it was it was great because here I am with this dog going to these five star hotels because we always would go ahead of the president. And it just was it was a great time. When you think back when you, at the time, you're not really thinking much of it. It's on the job. We're just going to do the job. But we're all we were all dressed in black. And here I have this black dog. So it would, you know, you don't think you're intimidating, but people would, oh my gosh, it, it was kind of intimidating because you're all dressed in black and, and here's this black dog and he looked very aggressive, even though he's a big baby, uh, <laughs> but it was, it was a great time. And I got to uh, train with the crime scene search people. So I was a crime scene search technician. I was in public affairs. Uh, I, I just had a great career. I started right at the end of Reagan's term. And I finished up uh, with Obama's term uh, there in the White House. And I moved down to Florida and going to retire. And that took about three months. And as an alpha personality, as you know, like, no, retirement. What, are you kidding me? So this job opened up with Pinellas County Schools down here in Pinellas County, Florida. And it fit my resume. And I said, well, let me try for this. And I went in and really not knowing what, what what the job was about. And it was so funny in the interview, I was asking the uh, superintendent and assistant superintendent and directors, what is what is my job category? And they it was just starting. This was back in, we're talking like 2013, 2014. So after Columbine, obviously, little by little, school systems are starting to build up how they were going to keep schools secure. And then they created these positions these emergency manager positions. So I kind of was like on my own. I didn't have autonomy, which which kind of bothered me. I had to go through certain levels, just like every other bureaucracy, school board, superintendent, my assistant superintendent. However, they left me alone. So I just went out and I said, okay, number one, I had over 100,000 students in my county, very dense county. It's about the 28th largest school system in the entire nation of 140 schools. And I just, I hate being a desk person. So I said, I, I'm going out to visit these schools. I made sure I emailed every one of these principals and I, I visited and met with all 140 principals. It took me over a year, but that's what I wanted to do. It was about customer service and meeting face to face so they can put, you know, it's everything, as you know, today, everything's emails. You send out an email from this, an email that one. No, I wanted to be face to face with these people. I wanted to see their school, what was going on. Yeah. So that started this whole ball rolling. And we started little by little 
from the outside. And that's what I learned from the Secret Service. Everything is layered, it's preventative, prepare from the outside. Then we worked our way into the schools. And then we started training the teachers and drilling the teachers on how, what to do during these emergencies. And that just, you know, exponentially got um, even more and more training and more drilling. And then, of course, as we know, the, the one, of, well, two of the biggest for me personally, uh, one was Sandy Hook up in Newtown, Connecticut. And if you've ever seen that town, my sister lives there. It is one town over from where I grew up. It is the idyllic Courier and Ives, New England community. And again, you would say to yourself, it's never going to happen here. Never. I mean, this is like paradise, really. And it's hard to get to the school. It's on this narrow paved road behind a fire department. You can't even see it from the road. And it just took this crazy person that it decided it was gonna, gonna do this. Then after that happened, again, I'm down here in Florida and as we're going along, then Parkland happened. And Parkland again, here I am in Florida and it's happened at this, this huge high school. And after Parkland, especially in Florida, I don't know if other states did the same thing, but after Florida, the legislature here said, you know what, we're going to have the local police, uh, the county police take over uh, school safety of all the school systems. And I disagreed with that, even though I'm former law enforcement. I disagreed with it because law enforcement is proactive. They're not reactive. I'm sorry, they're reactive, not proactive, because they just right. don't have time to do the training. Yes. And they just don't. So I left and I just became a consultant. And then after Uvalde, which we all know was a complete disaster, and I know the media focused on the law enforcement part, which they should have, but there were items and things that were going on at that school, you know, broken locks, the security guard was away, a teacher stepped out for a smoke. It just was, it was just a bad situation all around. Mm -hmm. And after that, uh, my wife said, I was mad. I was really angry. And my yeah. wife said, you got to put that, that down to writing. You got to do something. And then I started writing the book. And the book is a guidebook. It's only 77 pages long. I wanted something simple. I did not want a two or 300 page diatribe of a book that was going to sit on a shelf collecting dust about the administration and stuff. I wanted something simple, concise, practical. You can open it up. You know exactly what to do. Just... I, because I was, I was always a bottom-up person for me. I never liked the top-down stuff. I wanted to speak directly to the teachers, directly to the principals. This is what you need to do. And especially with parents to say, okay, look, you can open it. You can read the book in an hour, literally, in the book itself. And I'll mention about that now. The reason I called it the first five minutes was the FBI data showed. Now, uh, this is FBI data that takes a while to build up. This is back in like 2015. But I think it's still true today. The average time that it takes an active shooter in a school setting is three to five minutes for from beginning to end. They're either going to kill themselves, the police are going to get there, whatever. Seems like a long time because when you're involved in it, it just seems like hours. But yeah, usually three to five minutes. Wow. So that's what I call the first five minutes. And in the book, I've got a generic safety plan, which is just a very something simple you could print out. But what I did was, I created these little credit cards, you know, credit card size cards. They're a little laminated. Mm -hmm. And I, I just put in there, you know, what to do if, you know, if it's a tornado, an active shooter, a fire emergency, you're in a lockdown. Because Stacy, you know, I've been involved in stuff. You know, I was there at 9-11 when I was at the White House. But my training kicked in. And you just, you're just focused on that. You're, you're, you know, whatever training you, you have, you're just focused on that. Right. I've had incidents where they've either been in a real lockdown or even during a drill where you've had people that just absolutely freeze because no one knows how they're going to react during right. a real, you don't know, you don't know. Very so I created these cards and uh, you could put it on your lanyard with your ID or a lot of times teachers will have a copy card so to use for the copier uh, yeah. budget wise. And it just, if you forget something, you know, you go through a lockdown and you know, as you know, a lockdown is the door will be locked to the classroom, turn the lights off, close the blinds, sit quietly on the floor, silence your phones, don't listen to any announcements, don't open that door, and you're good. You wait for the good guys to come. And a lot of times teachers or anyone will look and go, oh my gosh, I forgot number four. And it's going to happen because you're, it's, your mind is just going to go blank. Yeah. I had a 
a middle school north of me in North County, they had, across the street, there was a guy, I was calling him a guy. He was mad at his mother's boyfriend. He didn't like his mother's boyfriend. So he decided to get himself a weapon and he was going to take care of business. So he's outside and he starts shooting at the house. Well, as he's doing that, some of these bullets strayed over and struck the school across the street. Oh, they wow. the lockdown, which is what they should have done. Yeah. Everything came out okay. No one got hurt. No one got shot at. But the school did the right thing by going into the lockdown. The assistant principal there was very up on all the security measures. She trained her people correctly. She did a lot of drilling. So after this incident, now this was a real incident. So they go into a lockdown. The police say everything's fine. We address the individual. You can go back to teaching. They do an after action report, which you should always do, even after a drill or, or a real thing. She right. found out. She found out that one third, one third of her teachers froze. Froze. And they had gone through drilling and training the entire year. So you don't know. You, you really don't know how you're going to react during these kind of situations. And that, that's, that's not putting blame on anybody. But I ask always to drill correctly, at least quarterly. I know fire drills are once a month. Mm -hmm. Pain in the butt. I mean, when's the last time a child died in a fire? It was 100, 100 something years ago, because nowadays, not only do we have firewalls, but doors that are for two hours, walls, you've got in sprinkler systems, uh, fire. I mean, it's just, it, it's just not possible. Yes, it's possible, but it's just not like it was when, when we were children. And right. a fire, you do blindfolded. I mean, you lock yourself out. Okay, you wait for the alarm to come back in. Okay, we're back in. Literally could take you 10, 15 minutes. For a lockdown drill, Stacy, at a high school, that's over a thousand kids. Forty-five minutes is the best I've ever done. Forty-five minutes. That's a long time, because yeah. then you get, then you get pushback. The principal's like, "Hey, we're doing testing. Uh, hey, I got complaints from teachers that they they don't have enough time to to finish their homework or they have testing coming up." And you're like, right. "You you try to you, you can't say to them, well, when's a good time?' Because if something happens. If some shooter comes in, they don't care if you're doing testing. They don't care about any of that stuff. They're going right. to start coming. Out like, hey, yeah. So I, what happened, Stacy, was I didn't have, well, I did have the power. I guess I could have done it, but I would have got a lot of complaints. I always like to do the drills unannounced, meaning mm -hmm. I want to see how you react when it just happens, not prepare for it. Because, Stacy, we're all human. If yes. I told, if I told you or anyone else, hey, we're going to have a lockdown drill at one o'clock this afternoon, what would you do as a human? You you want to get it done as soon as possible because you're busy. You got stuff going on. So what do you get? You're going to pre prepare. I'll already mm -hmm. have the doors locked. I'll turn the lights off. The blinds are already closed. Kids go over there and sit down. I want to get this over as fast as possible. I got homework and papers. I got it. And you're like, oh my god, no, this is not how this is supposed to work, right? It was very hard. So what I did was I said, look, I told the principals, let's do it this way, because you'd get complaints from parents. Also, child would come home. Hey, how did school go today? Oh, we ran a, a safety drill. They're like, what? Nobody told me. And now you get the emails and the phone calls to the school going, my child is upset. Yeah, there was a drill today. You didn't tell me. I didn't want him to be involved in the drill. Yada, yada, yada. All right, let's do this. Let's say during the week, we're going to have a lockdown drill. I'm not going to tell you what day it is, but just to let you know, during this week, we're going to run a drill. That way, and even though the rumors will still get out, oh, yeah, 2 o'clock this afternoon, run a drill. They'll have some kind of surprise to it, some kind of way. Because, Stacy, the way, the in order to drill, you have to find out the things that are wrong. Right. Stacey, I've had plenty of drills where we've gone through Half the school couldn't hear the PA announcement because the speakers were out. If you go through a phone system, you, the phone wouldn't work. The doors wouldn't lock. I mean, you have to do this to fix it. Yeah. It's not, again, there's no blame to this. You run the drill to find out what's wrong and you fix it. And right. that's why I wanted to run the drills. It, well, you can't do it monthly, but at, at least quarterly, You know, at least every three months run, run a lockdown drill. Now, the other thing is, uh, we had we had mentioned earlier about weapons being in schools, and that has become a real issue where you've got children that are bringing guns or knives or 
some other kind of uh, weapon into school. And obviously there's a lot more reasons than when you have an active shooter. The difference between the two. Yeah. When an active assailant wants to come in and just, I'm sorry, kill as many people as possible, they're planning this months in advance. This is yeah. not something they woke up one morning and say, I'm going to go in and shoot up a school. This is exactly. something that's months in advance. And they're going to go in targeting anybody who's who's um, an easy victim. I think the idea on the opposite side is when they bring weapons in the schools, there's other factors involved in that. They're either being bullied. Uh, they're curious. They The kids say, oh, your dad's got a gun. Yeah, we want to see it. Or so, some other reason that, that's going on why they're bringing these weapons into school. And that's what's being presented more often than an active shooter, even though I still want you prepared for both. However, right. what's happening, and I will quickly transfer over to this. There are marketing companies out there that are marketing some of this training that I think is, is dangerous. One of them is called Run, Hide, Fight. And Run, Hide, Fight was created for the corporate world. Mm -hmm. There's a video out there from uh, Houston Police Department and Department of Homeland Security. It's, it's at least 20 years old. It's a good video. It'll show the bad guy coming in. He's all dressed in black and he walks into an office and there's a narrator there with the, you know, uh, movie theater trailer voice saying, you know, oh, we this and that. And here's what you need to do. If you can run, you run out of the building to a safe place. You call 911, whatever. If you can't run, you hide in your office, under a desk, something. And then lastly, if that shooter gets to you, you know, in a close proximity, you need to fight grab something, a chair, fire, anything heavy to, you know, beat on this shooter. All right. For the corporate world, yes, that's something that you should be aware of. However, as it time went on, they transitioned it into the school system. And this happened right before I left after, after Parkland. And I couldn't understand. I said, wait a minute, you're going to have children running, number one. And I understand the hiding part, but I'm not going to have kids fight an adult some you know that's crazy yeah so that that was there for a little bit and i agreed that maybe high school kids yeah maybe they could run out of the building or out wherever they needed to go but the, the fight part i still disagreed with and what they did was they would modify it at these schools because they say oh we're going to do run hide fight but it's modified for middle and, and elementary schools we're not going to do the fight part i said well well then you're locking down i mean come on you call whatever you want but you're still locking down Right. This marketing thing that came out was a former law enforcement individual created this marketing company called Alice. And Alice is an acronym and it stands for alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. Way too much information, but it was, I guess it was easy to call this thing Alice. There's other ones out there called Alive, all kinds of acronyms. Right. And what they do is they market this, they will train the trainer. Usually they'll train a, a law enforcement person, a retired law enforcement person. They train the trainer, but you still got to think, you know, but how is this credible? What kind of certification are, are you getting? During right. this, act, the first one's alert, meaning an announcement will come over. There's an active shooter on campus. Blah, blah. Second is lockdown. I agree with that. Yes, you should lock down. The third part of this is inform, the I. Inform means once a, a staffer is supposed to look at the cameras in your school system and announce over the PA and follow the shooter to where they're going, meaning he's on the second floor or he's in building such and such. There's no school system in America that has that technology. They don't. Right. And I sure yeah. as heck want a staff member putting themselves at risk, calling over the PA of where the shooter is going. And then the C is counter. Now, they will argue with you that counter doesn't mean fight. Oh, no, it's not fight. Counter means we would want you to distract the shooter somehow by throwing things at this shooter. Okay, Stacey, so let's use some common sense here. <laughs> you've got a shooter that somehow enters a locked door that you've more than likely also barricaded, and you want students any everywhere from kindergartners up to high school to throw things precisely at the same moment at this shooter to distract them with what? Pencils, books, <laughs> iPad? You're gonna throw it at them precisely during a moment 
of the most chaotic emotional craziness. Yeah. It's just when you try to think of common sense, look, I'm trained, you know, to, to shoot. I, it, it, we are the only agency, in, as far as I know, in the world that has to qualify with our weapon once a month. Every month we have to qualify. Military people train over and over and over again to get what? The muscle memory, the implicit memory to get it so it just becomes rote. Athletes take forever, basketball, football, to precisely throw it exactly where it's going to go months and months. Right. So you take an hour and a half, two hours of training to train children to throw something precisely at the same moment at this shooter when, when they come in. It makes, it's no sense. It's like, what? It, it makes absolutely no sense at all. Yet, there are schools that are taking this training because the reason they're doing it is because they feel empowered. The one part of lockdown is that everyone says, not everyone, most people that disagree with it say they're sitting ducks. They're mm -hmm. in a locked classroom. Anybody can get to them. They're uh, being passive. This Alice training makes me feel good because I'm being reactive. I feel empowered. Right. And for whatever reason, people in education want to have that kind of empowerment. It's dangerous. Uh, yes. They've had all already, they've had uh, liability and legal issues just during the drilling for this type of training. So it, it doesn't make any sense. There is no backing by any child development program, child psychologist that backs this type of training. Um, again, you're getting into legal and liability areas uh, that you don't want to get into. So I, I, anyone who comes up with that to your school and parents, I need you to pay attention. If you hear something called run, hide, fight, or Alice, the red flag should go up going, why, why, why are you doing that? Why, are, why aren't my children safe being in lockdown? They are. There has been no incidents, documented incidents of any shooter, except for one. And I think that was targeted. That was on a, a Native American reservation that shot through a lock to get into the classroom. They will not shoot through a lock to get into the classroom unless it's targeted. And even then, I, I still haven't heard it happen. It takes too no. long. They're not going to sit there shooting at a lock. Perfect example is the Nashville uh, video, the Nashville shooter. Mm -hmm. That person shot out the glass doors and you see them walking down the hallway and they're trying the doors locked, move on, locked, move on. Then they find an open door, they go in. So they're not going to bother really with a locked door. It just takes too long because like I said, three to five minutes and it's done. And that again was a perfect example of how the police responded and they, they did an excellent job. I'm sorry that that principal for whatever reason thought she would come out in the hallway and I don't think she was confronting this year. I think she wanted to just talk her down or talk them down of like, what are you doing? That didn't work out too well. So I've had many incidents, uh, Stacy, of teachers that, I'm sorry, principals who are the boss, they're in charge of the school, who tell me during the drill, I need to go out on my campus and make sure all the doors are locked. I, um, what? I, so what are you going to do during a real event? Well, I'm right. going to go out and make sure the doors are locked. I said, are, are you carrying a weapon? Well, no, I want to make my, I, they're my kids. I need to keep them safe. I said, no, no, you need to lock yourself in that room over there until this is over. And right. you talk about the hardest thing, especially with elementary school uh, principals. They become very emotional when I'm talking to them about, but they, they will explain to you in tears, but they're my children. Uh, yes. The number one thing I say for everyone, everything, the two points I make. Number one, you keep yourself safe. That is the number one. You keep yourself safe. Then you can start saving lives. Keep yourself. Exactly. Don't. There's no reason. If you don't have a weapon, you're not trained that way to go out and confront or to, to make or run around the campus to make sure things are safe. Trust your people. That's why you drill. Just trust right. your people that the doors are locked, that everything's fine. So this idea that, oh, I need to go out and save my kids. No, that's. That's not, don't do that. Keep yourself safe. Second thing, and again, um, I'll, I'll make sure I wanted to bring this up. Down here in Florida, at the, not completely the whole state has the budget for it, but they did budget for school resource officers, armed school resource officers. And I know because of the BLM movement, because of the defund the police movement, that there's been pushback from students about having these officers in the schools. 
Well, they're not police officers. They're not there to arrest you. They don't have arrest powers. They right. are there. They're there for as an advocate for the students and the parents and the teachers. These people go through intense training. This is not, not, not that I'm denigrating the TSA, but they're not the airport employees there to check your bags. These people go through intense training. It's months of training, not only with their weapon, but with how to deal with students. And they are an advocate. And I always say that that is at least before everything else, technology or anything else, you get yourself some school resource officers because they are an advocate and they right. are trained to go. Now, there are some people who are going to say, well, look what happened in Parkland. That guy just stood there. He never went in. Or look what right. happened at this place. Or look, look, that's an anomaly. The, the media is going to focus on, on that. Exactly. These people... They got they will put their lives on the line for these students. So if you've got something in your school system where the students are complaining, oh no, that uniform makes me feel depressed or oppressed, or my cousin was arrested, so I don't want to deal with the police. Look, they're not police. They're not there to arrest you. They're there to protect you. So it's usually the parents that will speak up, going, oh no, we want the school resource officers back in school. We we want that. So that I advocate for that strongly that you get school resource officers in there. And we could segue a little bit, Stacey, about um, the technology. Because yeah. what happens a lot of times in these schools is you'll hear about an active shooter that kills however many number of, of students and, and, and teachers. And immediately at the next school board meeting, the hands will go up. We need metal detectors. We, we have to do, we have to have metal detectors. And a lot of times the school system will have a grant and it won't cost them much of anything to put in metal detectors. And they'll say, whew, done, we're good. We got the metal detectors, parents, you're satisfied. Everybody else said, oh, good. I got to go back to my office, we're done. No, it's what they call security theater. Metal detectors don't do anything. Right. Think of it in, in just a common sense way. If I'm a, a shooter and I'm, I'm out of my mind, obviously, and I have a weapon, and I plan this ahead of time. You think a metal detector is going to stop me from coming in and shooting up the school? No, I'll just, I'll just shoot everybody and keep going. So this idea that metal detectors somehow will make your school safer, it won't because not only now you have to train your staff, you have to worry about the maintenance of these machines, whether they work or not. What right. is the category or the percentage of things that are allowed in? I mean, we've seen it. We've seen it yeah. at airports. All kinds of weapons are coming in. They're missing all kinds of stuff. And you think metal detectors in schools are going to save you? And if I wanted to get that weapon in there, Stacy, how do you think I'm going to do it? I'm going to, there's a door open. I know where the door is open. I'll slide it in that door at the side of the school. After school, I'll put it in. During the sporting event, there you're going to get that weapon in one way or another. Right. So we'll stay away from technology. Good. Cameras are okay. If you got the budget for cameras, but you're not going to get the super duper sci-fi where you, these cameras will zoom in. You could follow people. That's not going to happen. But, you know, you put your cameras at your entrances, outside areas where, but you know what? These kids know where these cameras are. Don't you think even, you know, if we were kids in school, you knew every hiding place under the stairs where there were no cameras. So it's not that they're dumb, but it's, uh, it's just crazy. But anyway, yeah, you, it's okay to have cameras. It's okay to have systems where you can push a button to make an announcement. I don't let the, like this idea of having an app because I've had all kinds of marketing people come after me after a shooting when I work for the system. Hey, we've got something, an uh, app on your phone. You push a button, it calls the police. It locks all the doors. It does this, all this whiz bang stuff. And you're like, oh, okay, let's try it out. And they would have a pilot program. And we went to this one high school and they said, yes, it's supposed to work on Wi-Fi and it works on LTE. And we go there and the Wi-Fi system goes down and blank. And you're like, what happened? Oh, well, we'll work on it. We'll work on it. And then they finally fixed it. And then we had an incident for real there. And half the system was working. The other half wasn't working. The teacher's like, I can't get through on my phone. You're like, oh, my God. <laughs> so this, yes, eventually, I don't know, Stacey, maybe with this AI, things will happen I, I, more rapidly. I mean, just recently, my school system here, they are doing the automated announcement, which is fine. That's okay. You push a button on a phone or whatever, it makes an automated announcement. Good to go. That, that's good because I, usually I used to have people or principals actually live, you know, get the PA. There were schools 
that the, had the old system, the big board, and you used to take the microphone and clip it off the board and push a button and you call through the microphone to get, you know, go through his PA system. It's like, oh my God, that's like 1960s. What are you doing? And it just, it was money, it was a budget, you know, and a lot of these school systems, they don't have the budget. I went to a conference. Now, this is a while ago. Because here I've been out, geez, I've been out uh, almost over 10 years. Um, I went to this conference up in North Carolina and they were talking about the social justice stuff and everything. And I, I'm like, okay, no, I don't, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about how we do this drilling correctly. And right. there was an individual there who just got hired as a director of safety and security of Oakland, the Oakland schools in California. And he, you know, gave this little talk. It was one of these side, you know, uh, deals. And at the end of it, I went up to him and I said, you know, where I was from is from Pinellas County. I said, oh, I says, are you having issues, you know, with your door locks or, or uh, your cameras at your school? And he looks at me like I was crazy. He goes, he goes, I don't have a budget for cameras. I have no cameras. And I looked at him like, oh, my God. So it was this dynamic of I was fortunate that I was in a, a county system that had enough money for that. And here, yeah. Oakland, I'm thinking Oakland, California. Oh, my gosh, it must be, you know, fairly enough money. Didn't yeah. have a budget. So there's plenty of schools out there that, that don't even have good door locks or cameras uh, in their school. And it's something that, you know, Stacey, like everything else, safety doesn't take a priority until something happens. It's yeah. way low on the list. I mean, come on. How much time do we lose during a pandemic? At, at right. minimum, two years. So mm -hmm. now the grading system is bad. We've already seen statistics where math and science the scores are way down. I mean- uh we're behind countries that we shouldn't be behind and it's hurting these children and you know you're going to come in and talk about safety and they're looking at you like you're crazy i want to get my grades up however you know you try to explain to them look if they're not safe they're not going to learn so yeah. at least i i ask at least every quarter do some kind of lockdown drill some kind of safety drill to get your teachers the confidence that when something happens they'll know and they'll accept it and they'll have the confidence to do it. That's why I avoid this Alice or run, hide, fight training. And I'll tell you one little story. I have um, a physical therapist because I, I just had some knee surgery. And uh, she has a child, who one in high school, a girl's in high school, and her son is in middle school. And I'm talking to her about, you know, uh, these drillings and this Alice marketing and this run, hide, fight. And she's looking at me. She said, well, why would we have children go out in the hallway to run away and you don't know where the shooter is? And I said, you're right. I, if I'm teaching there, I'm not going out into a hallway. I don't, I don't care. Even if they told me where he was, there might be a second shooter. I'm, I'm perfectly safe in this classroom. So uh, I went and saw her the next week and I talked to her and she says, oh, I talked to my son and they did a drill. And I said, how did that go? And she said, yeah, they I made an automated announcement. And I said, what did they do? And she said, they stayed locked down in the classroom. And she asked him, she said, well, you know, I don't know how old he was, 12, 13 years old. She asked him, he said, would, would you run out in the hallway and, you know, to run away from the shooter? And he looked at her and he goes, mom, why would I go out in the hallway if there's a gunman out there? And I said, I love this kid. He's got common sense. Common sense. <laughs> right. And that's, uh, it's, uh, I tell you, there are options that's been trained for these teachers. And I hate that word because imagine you're a teacher. Let's do a hypothetical. Mm -hmm. You're a teacher in a school system and the announcement comes over and says, there is a, we're going to lockdown because it's a shooter on campus. Some of these schools will give teachers options. They have the option of running out of the school with their students or right. staying in the classroom with a lockdown, okay? And it's like, wait a minute, why? If I'm a teacher, why are you giving me options as as hyped up and adrenaline running and panic inducing as all this is of having a shooter on your campus? Now you're yeah. going to make me as a teacher the liability of having the option of taking 25 children and running them out of the hallway, not knowing what kind of danger they're going to face instead of just staying in a lockdown. And that's what's yeah. been happening in a lot of these schools, because it's kind of a knee jerk emotional thing. Like, Oh no, lockdowns have been in existence for 20, 30 years. We need something new. We got to do something new. Let's do this options based training where the kids will run out of the school and run away from the, the shooter. Well, that didn't work so well in Parkland. I mean, that was a perfect example in yeah. Parkland. They had trained a month earlier. 
They trained for a lockdown drill, okay? And when the incident happened, there were two teachers they interviewed afterwards and the teachers thought it was another drill because they're hearing this pop, pop, pop. They're hearing the shooting going, oh, they must be doing another drill. Right. Real what they didn't train for was a fire alarm and the sprinkler system going off. So now wow. they're panicking like, wait a minute, the fire alarm, we're supposed to leave during a fire alarm. So you had half the school, fire, you know, fire alarm got to leave. The other half going, no, we stay into a lockdown. So there was this mass confusion. And one of the teachers said, you know what? I hear the shots at the other end of the school. We're going to run out of the building. What they were hearing was echoes. So they were running towards the shooter. So if this idea that you need to run out of the classroom, it's they're not sitting ducks. They're not. They're safe. It takes three to five minutes. You're waiting for the good guys to come. They're coming. Just wait. They're coming. I know you're going to hear horrible sounds, screaming, it, it, but just the good guys are coming. So just try to keep your kids calm. And I tell you, in my county, um, you know, I was usually what I was usually the ghost. Yeah. I would, and I, I've done over hundreds of these things, Stacy. I either observed them, supervised them, or actually was participating in them. And I try to tell people, no, I was actually physically there. It wasn't a Zoom call. It wasn't a tabletop. Right. I would go to school and we would run these drills and I would be a ghost acting as if I was a, a shooter. And I would go around banging on doors. You know, I would, I would go around trying the locks, to try to get in. And I had schools, especially elementary schools, because as you know, elementary kids are going to listen, that they listen. Once you get the middle of high school, it's a little different. They don't listen so well. You know, we all went through that stage. But mm -hmm. I've gone through schools where you would think that school was empty, that there was no one there. And I was so proud of these kids. I've had kids when I would, they would unlock the doors and I would go in and some of these kids would be, they would double up because a lot of the elementary school classrooms have their own bathrooms. So, so the, um, teacher, the teacher would stuff 25 kids into the bathroom, stack them up in there. And I would say, it's, you're thinking, that's great. Now you got double protection. And these kids would come out with smiles on their faces. And I said, you guys, however, you got five gold stars today. And they would come out beaming. Because you want these kids to feel proud of themselves. They, they didn't let the bad guy in. I mean, it was just great. You want to have these kids have this empowerment that they did this great thing that they hid right. from the bad guy. And it just, I tell you, I know people want to say that the kids are naive or we want to protect them. Or, I mean, you're too young. But when I was a kid, it was all about the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we used to have to go out into the hallway and duck and cover because, you know, God forbid there was a, a nuclear bomb coming. Come on, your kids. You're not thinking of that. You're not thinking of that at all. You're listening to what your teacher's telling you. So you're sitting there on the floor, you grab ass and you're talking and they tell you, oh, no, you got to be quiet. And, you know, you just want it over with. Right. Same nowadays with these kids, they know what's going on. You know, they, they know you don't want to, you know, panic them or make them paranoid or make them have bad dreams. You know, especially the little kids, which I concentrate on more than anything. It's just, you know, you, you, you know, we're just hiding from the bad guy. We don't want, want nothing bad to happen. And, and they forget this stuff. But they're not naive. I had a right. school that was a, an open school, meaning that the area in the center was open and the school was a circular pattern and it was two floors. And when we went up to the second floor, there were two glass doors. And when you entered that, there were five, uh, like a half circle of five classrooms. And I went in and I asked the, one of the teachers, I said, well, who locks those outer doors? And she said, I do. And they had a plan B. If she wasn't there, it'd be this designated. And I said, okay. And all the kids are there. And I said, um, where, where's the key? And the kids immediately, all of them raised their hand. I know where the key is. I know where the key is. I said, where is it? They're, it's out there in the fire extinguisher thing. I'm like, oh my gosh, let's go. So I had all those kids, like fifth grade in the classroom, go out, take those keys out and lock those outer doors. I said, you guys are heroes because if your teacher faints or is, is gets sick or is disabled, you guys can go out and lock those outer doors and you made yourself doubly safe. And you see these kids, they just felt empowered. Like, oh my gosh, they did this great thing. So right. they want to help, you know, and that's the thing about little kids. They want to help. They want yeah. to be involved. They're not naive. I had a school, not the same school, open atmosphere. We're doing a drill and the principal always liked to trick things up. He always liked to throw a monkey wrench in, I guess you'd call it. Yeah. And he goes out during the drill, lockdown drill. And during the lockdown drill, obviously, you're not supposed to open the door for anyone. You're not supposed to listen to any announcements, fire alarm or anything. No, you stay in your classroom. 
So he goes out into the center of the school with a megaphone and he right. says, the drill's over. It's all over. Everybody come out. We're all done. Go back to school. All his permanent teachers were like, uh-uh, no, we know that's a trick. Two of the substitute teachers were like, yeah, let's open things up, turn the lights on. And the kids, no, 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 it's a trick. He's trying to trick us. He's trying to, they know, they know. Right. So this idea that you need to overly protect them or protect them from the drill uh, itself. Uh, no, it, it doesn't wash with me. I mean, these kids, they, they know, uh, even though, and we've talked about this, Stacey, as they got older, when you get to middle and high school, just the mental health issues, the, you know, the, the social media, the cell phones, uh, the cyber bullying, stuff yes. that, you know, we, we talked about when we were in school yeah. and there was, sure, you had bullying, I was bullied. And, but once you left school, you, okay, we're done. The, you know, the, 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 you're, you're done with the bullying. Nowadays, it's a 24 hour cycle. Because yes. they're going to get on the internet, they're going to cyber bully them, they're going to send these messages, they're going to text them, TikTok, Instagram, whatever the heck. And these kids that are bullied are just getting pounded and pounded and pounded. And after a while, I can understand that they had enough. And yeah. I'm going to start planning the hell with this crap. I'm going to take care of business. And I think that's what leads to a lot of these, these shootings that happen because they plan ahead of time. There right. are probably there are already issues at home. Mm -hmm. you know, not all not all shooters are like this. There have been shooters that have been from middle class that had no problems at all. And they just decided one day, um, you know, the Columbine shooters weren't, you know, some kind of weird mental health issues. They were just, I don't know, they just decided they were going to do this. But um, yeah, it just the, the social media, as we talked about, is just something that is not it's not good. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, the kids, they don't, there's no reason for them to be on TikTok and Facebook and that stuff. I know they like doing that because today, as you know, kids won't talk to each other face to face. It's all texting. You'll have yeah. kids from one room to another are texting instead of going and talking to each other. I, I, your mind, and I, I blame, I blame the adults also because you and I know, and, and I've been in the corporate world. When you go into the a meeting, everybody's got their phones. Everybody's yes. thinking about something because they want to feel important. And if even if you put your phone down, if it buzzes or something, uh, excuse me, I got to get that. And they'll get it and they'll go out and say, what are they doing? The other, they're texting. Yeah. So it's just something that's this monster that's uh, created, I, I think, you know, something bad in society that this constant texting. And so, and I, I'm, I'm guilty of it too. What is the first thing you do in the morning? Used right. to be you go to the bathroom. Uh uh. You pick up the phone. You tell what's going on with the what's going on in the world. I need to find out. Oh my God, put the phone down. Right. So it's it's just, and I tell you, and we mentioned this. I mentioned this earlier uh, when we were talking. Uh Italy, France, uh, no cell phones in school, and they've done studies. They found out these kids are happier. Mentally, they're they're much better off. They yes. their schoolwork is done uh on time. And I think their home life is much better. It's just something that needs to be done here. And why I don't understand why Europe is ahead of us on this. I don't get it. We should be the yeah. leaders in, in this kind of thing. So I, I know it's a little off topic, but um, it's just something that I, I believe, you know, needs to be done. I'm sorry. I've been, I've been talking and talking. I, you probably got some questions for me. No, I, I think that's a great, um, that's a, you, you made quite a few um, great comments. You know, one, I, I agree with you. I think that school systems really need to put a halt on on having their cell phones in school because I think it, it you know, kids today, they're, even their communication skills, they don't know how to communicate with other individuals. And it's because they're constantly on the phone. They didn't have the interaction that we had when we were young, where we didn't have cell phones. We actually, you know, we had to interact and communicate with other human beings. And even with school, we had to go to a library if we had a report to do we had to do the research you know nowadays everybody you know is just looking up the answers and and they're not you know they, there's very little thought that goes into a lot of things and that's probably one of the reasons why this the score is besides covid has dropped so low you know um 
my oldest son, I have three children, you know, he learned cursive writing. The other two, they took cursive writing out of the school system. I was like, what is all this about? You know, my other two can't read cursive writing. And it, and it, and it baffles my mind. Like, why take it out of the school system? You know, um, you know, I think, I think, you know, the, the cell phones could be good, but they also could be bad. There's pros and cons to it. And we, we like everything, we need limitations. And I think that's what we lack in our, in our society is the limitations. How far do we go and when do we start putting limitations to you know help our society to help our children to help our future you know um generation and you know that i think that 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 strikes a big problem in you know i i and the, the cyberbullying you know i i've heard so many cases where kids have committed suicide because of the cyberbullying from the cell phones yes no i agree i agree yeah it's 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 not something good but we, it's not something we can change today but what I did want to mention, and I'm sure you're going to ask the question, what parents can do. And I ask parents to talk to their children. And I know a lot of times, because I have a 17-year-old, they come home, how was school today? Fine. Boom. And they're upstairs. Or they're yes. in their, or they're on their texting. They're going to do their thing. Um, just try to catch them. Hopefully, when you're sitting at the dinner table, I know that's a hard thing nowadays. We all sit together at the dinner table. But just try to just ask them. Um because usually they'll get a message. Usually they'll get a message from school saying we ran a drill today. Now you can ask them, did you run a safety drill today? Yes. If not, then just ask them, what are you doing at school for your safety drills, for your lockdown drills? And let them answer what we locked down in our class and, and try to pin them down and be specific. What right. is it that you do, do? Do they lock the doors, close the blinds? Oh, yeah, yeah, mom. Yeah, they, that's what they do. Okay. And then they want to do something else. But if they say... Oh no! Today we we ran out of the school to you know a certain point uh, down the hallway, uh, like where we go for the fire drill. That's where the red flag should go up. Going, why are you running out of the school? Well, that's what they told us. The school told yeah. us to do that. That's where then now you have to start questioning things. Um, and I always say, look, there's no. You, you've got the power to go to a school board meeting. I understand you get three minutes. But three minutes, you know, when you think about it, it's a pretty long time. You can get a good page and a half out in three in three minutes and just ask them, you know, studies are out there. The data is out there that says lockdowns work over this Alice training, this run, hide, fight, which is dangerous for children, especially during the drilling. Yeah. Um, if you don't get anywhere that way, start writing letters or emails to your legislatures and saying, you know, this is what we're doing in my school. I disagree with this. Uh, this was something that's not safe for my children. You, they've got plenty of people out there. Two of my mentors, I do want to mention, one is Michael Dorn. He's with an organization called Safe Havens International. I think it's safehavensinternational.org, one of the largest organizations in the world that has done the research. They have done the data on these types of trainings and drilling. And the other is uh, Dr. Ken Trump. Uh, he's not any relation to the former president. He's got at least 30 or 40 years experience. Um, I think his website is safeschools.com. So if you just Google his name, it'll, it'll come up. Uh, but right. both those individuals are mentors of mine, and they agree that lockdowns work uh, over anything else that's uh, out there, any kind of knee-jerk reaction to these run, hide, fight, or Alice training. So those two individuals, if you have questions, obviously, you can also contact me, uh, not only through my LinkedIn uh, page. Uh, I've got my first five minutes on Facebook. Uh, my book, which is on Amazon, if you type in the first five minutes, it should come up in like you know, one of your top five there, but I'm not, I'm not on your podcast to sell books. That's not, it's, it's 12 bucks. It's, it's not, it's like I said, it's 77 pages long. To me, it's more about the message and just the awareness of what's going on in your school system when, when they deal with safety. Cause I'm telling you, Stacey, I really wish there was a button we could push or something we could do to say we're, we're done. We don't have to worry about school shootings anymore. Um, they're going to happen. They're going to continue to happen. And it, I don't want to make schools a prison. So there's a fine line between, you know, having an open atmosphere, but also keeping everyone inside safe. So yes. that's what I dealt with when I was with the county system, with the fencing, with the lobby areas. And I asked for uh, uh, countertops to be raised up to at least four or five feet. And then you have the tempered glass to come down. So you have a little space, like a bank. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's intrusive. I get it. But I want to keep anyone from jumping over the counter. And the reason we did that is because 
someone jumped over the counter and started running into the school because they wanted to get their child. Um, so yeah, it seems intrusive. You get this claustrophobic feeling, but that's kind of a reality today. The rest of the school is left open. And I do ask, and most schools are doing this, keep your classroom doors locked during uh, school time. I know okay. it's a pain because some teachers will say, oh, I got to go. This one wants a pass. This one wants to go to the nurse. This one wants to, sorry, keep it locked. You're already one step ahead if you go into a lockdown. The other right. thing that's important is the outer perimeter of your school. Multiple times. And I can tell you, if I do it, if I go today, I will see multiple doors wedged open. Mm -hmm. And the reason they're wedged open is number one, it's usually a student or a teacher that's late so they can get into the school a pizza delivery, you're stepping out for a smoke, whatever it is, you will go around and you'll see those doors wedged open. And guess who's watching these schools? These shooters. They're either yeah. current students or they're former students. And they see which door is wedged open. They see which gate is left open. They know exactly what the lockdown drills are. All They plan this, like I said, months in advance. So they're not just running in, I say willy nilly, and start shooting. No, they have a plan. So the, what I ask, and I know it's, I, I know it's tough, especially for middle or high school. It used to be when we were kids, we would have committees. You'd have student committees uh, about whatever. Usually it was either kids that wanted to get into law enforcement or, or, or the military, and right. you'd have safety committees. Nowadays, look, if you have ownership in your school, I mean, you're all cheering on the athletic department, football, basketball, whatever. If you have ownership in your school, you want to keep the school safe. So yes. not only do you have SROs, but just go around a while. You're not ratting out anybody. You are going around the outer perimeter of the school to make sure all those doors are closed. Right. The, the wedges, get rid of them. Close the door. Maybe they'll wedge it open in another hour, but at least go around the school, you know, once every couple of hours. I mean, what's it take out of your study period to do that? You just walk around the school. Exactly. It, it just, it's just something simple that you can do that have ownership in the school to, to keep the doors closed. Because I had a high schools with even SROs in it. I would walk around and there'd be doors wedged open. All right, one more story before we go. I know you probably have to get going. No, this is I, good. I, I, I was told by my uh, superintendent, he said, Dan, I've got a high school up there in North County that I'm getting complaints about, that the, the kids can come and go as they please. Uh, they've got exits that are open. They're they're not really uh, secure. I want you to go up there and check it out. So I basically go up there undercover and mm -hmm. I put this hat on. I didn't have my pass out. You know, so I just look like some schmo. I'm walking around. And nowadays, as you know, high school campuses are big. They're almost as big as college campuses when we were kids. So right. I go in and obviously it was easy to get on, on a high school campus. And I start walking around and I'm being friendly. Kids are going, hey, how you doing? Teachers, how, how is everybody? No, nobody's challenging me which we told, if you don't see a pass, you don't have to confront the person, but just come up and say, can I help you? I noticed you don't have a pass. Did you go, can I escort you to the office and, and they'll check in. Nobody does this. So like for half an hour, I'm wandering around the campus and I'm like, this is ridiculous. Nobody's even talking to me. Yeah. So on the back of the campus, um, there was a, a room with glass windows. It was like uh, for cheerleaders and uh, ballerinas or something. And they were um, oh, the twirlers where they twirl the ribbons or something. And yeah. they were all practicing back there. So I, I pretended like I was taking pictures and I start walking back and I said, well, this is crazy. I said, let me walk back to the office and tell these people they're the, you know, th this is horrible. I'm just, well, I'm just some stranger here. How come, you know, anybody can get on the campus. Exactly. And there was one assistant principal there who I had met previously. Well, I wasn't sure if he would recognize me or not. So right. as walking, he it's right around lunchtime. So there's a lot of kids outside, on you know, back and forth between the classrooms. And he looks at me at one time and I just look away and he looks back and he starts to drift over and he comes in. And he goes, can I help you? And I played the part. I said, yeah, I'm looking for my car. And it completely threw him off. He goes, your car. I said, yeah, I parked out here some. I don't remember where I parked. But I love your high school. I said, I like going to different high schools and just looking around. This is really nice here. And it completely threw him. He's like really confused. And I, I, I put in the dagger. I said, yeah, I was back here. And there were a bunch of girls back there, like cheerleaders or something. And I took some pictures of them. And all of a sudden, the red flag goes up. He grabs me by the arm. He says, you got to come with me. So as soon as I talked about me taking pictures of these kids, right? 
So yeah. he's leading me towards the gate to the office. And I finally, I pulled my pass out. And I said, I'm so-and-so. I said, I was sent here by my superintendent. I gave the name and I gave the name of the assistant superintendent. And he still, <laughs> he was so out of it. He goes, you're who? Who sent you? I mean, it just, his mind was completely gone. So yeah. by the time he got to the front office, finally he calmed down. And he said, oh, okay. I said, this is, I was assigned to do this. I was told to come here by the assistant superintendent because you're having issues at the school. Stacy, while we're there, they have one of these big, oh, it's a big metal fence gate that swings right. over, right? While we're there, some kid comes up, takes his backpack, throws the backpack over the fence, which hits a button, opens the gate, and he walks in. <laughs> and I oh look at God. him, like, and I'm pointing, and he goes, yeah, we got to fix that. I'm like, oh, my God. <laughs> so oh, my God. It was, it was just this crazy thing that I I, I wish I could have done it on more campuses because in order to do that, it wakes people up going, oh my God. Yeah. And I told them I was walking around here for 30 minutes and nobody stopped me. I said, you have to train your people. You don't have to be confrontational. Just be helpful. Hi, I exactly. noticed you're in the past. Come to oh my, that was the hardest thing to do. And these are teachers and principals who are in, should interact, but it's yes. even happened on, on elementary schools. I've gone into elementary schools, gone over to the picnic table and just sat there, just sat there. Everybody going by, hi, I'm talking to the kids, hi, no pass, nothing. Hi, how you doing? And, and oh, oh my God, because there's always a gate open somewhere in order yes. to get. And when I challenge the principals, they're shocked. And I said, this is this is what happens. This You have to be cognizant of this, especially elementary school kids. How right. easy would it be to grab a kid and be gone in 30 seconds? It, it's just something that, and I don't mean to scare parents now that are they're listening. But it's just something that you need them to be aware of, that they need a secure campus. Uh, so nothing uh, like that happens, especially elementary schools, you know, it, it, because these kids, you know, again, some of them are naive and uh, they'll talk to strangers. Some of them won't. Hopefully they'll have stranger danger. But, um, yeah, it was just the high school was just kind of funny. But they, they fix it. You have to fix it. You have to point it out to them. This is what happened. I, you know, I'm a perfect example. So you got to fix it. So. That was just something that, you know, was a story that was a little funny, but, you know, not so much because it happened <laughs> right in front of me. But anyway, uh, I appreciate you having me on. This was oh, a great venue. Um, read my book if you want. Like I said, yes, I'm not yeah. here to, to sell books, um, but it will give you some good information. Parents, I want you to talk to your kids, uh, talk to your school board if you have any issues like that, because I... You know, fingers crossed, knock on wood, nothing has happened yet. Nothing really serious about these active shooters. But we all know it, it's something that's going to happen again. Uh, yes. And it's not just schools. You know, we've seen it. Walmart, Target, nightclubs. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad we didn't, uh, you didn't uh, want to bring up this issue of gun control because that's something that very divisive. And that's something that we can't resolve today. And that, that's something that's that's a separate issue that's out of out of my lane uh, that I really want to talk about but um yeah just uh number one you keep yourself safe that's right. number one keep yourself safe number two armed sros on your campus which are a great advocate yeah. for your school and your students so those are at least two things i want people to get out of this uh podcast yeah and you definitely made it very clear you know i i think every everything you shared today was just so valuable and you know people really have to understand the importance and understand the protocol on how to keep safe you know because people you know that you know a lot of times people think well oh i could you know i could protect you know them and this and that and they like you said they get empowered but when the actual event occurs that's when people get into panic mode. That's when people can't think clearly. And that's when people don't react smartly. And, you know, but if you practice and you know the protocol and you understand what has to be done, it's just like anything, like you said, with the athletes, you know, they practice and practice and practice till they get it right. I think schools need to do that as well. They need to practice and practice and practice till they feel confident enough that they know the protocol and they stick with it and not try to be a Superman. Just go by the protocol because it's there for a reason. It's there because it works. It's proven to work. And it's the best, you know, choice, you know, when it comes to the safety of our children. Yes, exactly. I couldn't have said any better. That was I that's exactly what I would like to hear from you and from parents. 
great. That was, that was, I, I can't say anything more. That was perfect. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. I, you know, and thank you so much for coming on the show. Uh, this has been wonderful. I, I, you know, Lieutenant Dan, you, you've been amazing and I love, I love everything that you provided. Thank you so much for sharing this value information. And I, I appreciate everything you've done all these years to keep, you know, our, our nation, our society, our children safe. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Thanks for having me on. Oh, thank you very much for being on. Have a great day. You too.